And so we're going to continue to talk about God's promises today. If you have your Bibles, why don't you take those out? There are Bibles under the chairs if you want to borrow one to use. You can even take it home. Those, we would love for you to take a Bible home if you need one. Also, take your phones at this point and set them on silent so they don't ring right in the middle of the service. Uh, when that happens, pastor comes down and shakes your hand. Everybody knows who, who did that. So set those phones to silent or you'll be embarrassed on uh, world global television. Uh, so, all right. Praise the Lord. So we're talking about God's promises. Say promises. God is a promise-making God. The Bible's full of promises from the Lord to us as people. And I'm talking about how we can learn his promises, receive his promises, live in his promises. What we're really talking about is walking by faith, not by sight. Because when we're walking in the promises of God, a lot of times you've got to walk by what the Word says, not what your eyes might see. Somebody say amen to that. Okay, so I've got a 32-page message here. You're good till 2 o'clock, right? No, somebody in the back goes, no. Oh, okay. Uh, so last week we talked about Joshua. And we talked about how Joshua believed the promises of God and led his people into the promised land where they could conquer the land and live in the promised land. And we talked about how, in many ways, that story in Joshua is indeed an historical thing. It really happened, but it's also a spiritual metaphor for all of us to be invited to conquer and live in our promised land, the promise of God land. But I felt like last week, we didn't really, you ever heard the expression, close the loop? The close loop means to make a full circle about what we're talking about. And we talked about how victorious Joshua was and how Joshua led the people to victory. But we didn't talk about uh, the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room. I could tell it was here. Just nobody wanted to talk about it. It's like, okay, pastor, what happens if we fail? What happens if we believe God for a promise and it doesn't happen. It doesn't work out. We pray for a healing and they don't get well. We pray for a financial blessing and they don't get blessed. We pray and God doesn't seem like he answers. It feels like failure. How do we deal with that? And we've always said that we're going to be real people here. And I know that for most of us, we can point to at least one time in our life where we experienced failure. Some of us can think of lots of times when we experience failure. So why don't you turn to the book of Joshua, and let me, I want to close that loop. I want to talk about how do you deal with failure when it happens. Does it mean the promises of God aren't true? Does it mean that somehow it's all just a fantasy? In psychology, we, they, were, they trained us to not have what they called magical thinking. Anybody heard that phrase? In psychology, secular psychology, magical thinking is the idea that just all of a sudden things are going to get okay. You know, all of a sudden it'll be bippity bobbity boo it's all good for you and me. And they call that bad thinking, to live in a magic world. But see, we're not living in a magical world, we're living in a God world. Where his promises are true. But the problem is, how do we reconcile that statement with the occasional failure in our lives. So that's what we want to talk about today. You okay to go down that rabbit hole with me? All right. So Joshua, Joshua in your Bibles. Just a little background, and then I want to talk about very practically how to deal with failure. Okay, so a little background. Joshua chapter 6, 18 through 19. Uh, the Lord speaking to Joshua as they're about to go to battle in the promised land. And remember, the promised land was uh, a land that was already uh, lived in by several tribes. 
Sometimes we think of the promised land just an open area where they could just move in and set up camp. It wasn't like that. There were people living there, and they had fortified cities. And it wasn't going to be as simple as just rolling into the uh, campground and putting up your Winnebago. It didn't work like that. And God spoke to Joshua in chapter 6, verse 18. And this is an important part of this covenant that God made with Joshua that would give him uh, the victory. He says, and you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Now, underline in your Bibles this phrase. It's important. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So God says to Joshua, we're going to send you in and you're going to overcome Jericho. You're going, to, you're going to conquer the city. It'll be the first step in the conquering the promised land. But when you come into Jericho and when you beat those folks and those walls come down, what's it say? All of the gold, the silver, the vessels of bronze and iron, they're God's. So he says, those things belong to him. Now, there was a, a way they did war in those days where when your army would march on a city and you would break down the walls and you would win the battle, you would go through and take whatever you wanted. You could just take the gold, the bronze, the silver. You could even take the women and the, and the, the uh, children and the animals. When you conquered, you took it all. And God tells Joshua, it's not going to be that way for you guys. When you go into this city of Jericho and you win, because of my promises, you don't get the gold and the silver and the bronze. And that's God's. Everybody with me on that? Does it seem pretty clear? Is it difficult to understand? Ah, it seems pretty clear, pretty easy to understand. So Joshua... He would have explained all of that to his soldiers and his people. When you go into Jericho, you know, the walls are going to come down. You're going to go in there. You're going to win the gold, the silver, the bronze, the brass. That's God's. Don't take it. Amen? Everybody's got it. Okay. Now, chapter 7, verse 1. This is background. Here we go. But, uh-oh, here we go. But the children of Israel committed a trespass. Regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not, be, do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shabarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted. And Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads. So, just again, God had promised them to win. Amen? They had conquered Jericho, which was no small thing. And they said, okay, the next city we got to go against is Ai. Ai is northwest of Jericho. And so uh, they send up the spies. The spy says, ah, Ai is a piece of cake. Don't worry about it. 3,000 men, plenty. The rest of you guys take a holiday. We'll, we'll just go take it, no problem. Unfortunately, what he did not know, what Joshua did not know, was that Achan had taken gold and silver from Jericho. He had taken the things he wasn't supposed to do. And he hid them in his tent. Now that's something we'll discover later. So here's Joshua. He's thinking, I got God's promises. We're going to win. Amen? 
We just saw Jericho fall. Amen. AI, piece of cake. God's promises are true. He sends up his soldiers to fight them, and they turn tail and have to run. They're routed. They're beaten. It says they were killed on the descent, meaning they turned their tail and ran down the hill, and they're coming up behind him to kill them. 36 soldiers die. This is a disaster. What happened? 36 dead. The army of Israel beaten. What happened? Can you see the problem? Joshua says, hey, God, you promised me a win. We're supposed to win here. You promised this land to us. You proved it with Jericho. And so we have this piddly little mountain town of Ai. We go up there, and we get whooped. What kind of God makes promises like that? What was it, all a trap? Did you just want me to send my army up there so they get whooped? Come on, God, what kind of God are you? Are you a good God or not? Amen? Because this was a shocking loss. This wasn't losing to some big old army. This is shocking. How does this happen? The same God who pro whose promises brought him through the Red Sea, the same God who licked Pharaoh, who beat the Egyptians, that same God can't take care of Ai? Wow. Failure. Say the word failure. It's a failure. So Joshua, as we read in verse 6, he responds. He responds correctly, by the way. Tears his clothes. That's the way of showing grief in that culture. Grieving for the 36 families. Tears his clothes. Falls on his face before the ark of the Lord. He and the elders. And they call upon the Lord saying, What in the world happened to you, God? Now let's look at verse 10 through 13. 10 through 13, chapter 7. The Lord said to Joshua, so the Lord speaks. He hears his prayers. He speaks to him. God says to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. Stolen and deceived. And they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore. You! That's a hard thing to hear. I won't be with you anymore, says God, unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up and sanctify the people. And say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing. Wow. So God answers. So the, whose fault was the defeat? Was it God's fault that they lost to Ai? Was his promise untrue? Was his promise wrong? No, it wasn't his fault. He had made a covenant with the people. A covenant is like a contract. He had said, listen, if you guys do this, I will do this. If you keep your contract, I will give you this promised land. You'll, you'll win every city. You'll do it all. But the contract was broken. Achan stole gold and silver and kept it for himself. And so the contract is null and void. Now, guess what, Israel? You're on your own. Let's see just how well you do without God. Well, we know how well they did. They got whooped. Are you getting the church? Now, Joshua, again, to his credit, he acts on what God says. Now, you can read the next part of the story. We haven't got time, but they do a whole lottery system to determine where the sin in the camp is. And it comes down indeed to Achan. And Achan confesses. They go to his tent. 
and they find the gold and silver buried right there in his tent, guilty as sin. But that's where it gets hard because they take Achan and his whole family out and kill them all. It seems so harsh, doesn't it? And it's like, but they had to deal with the sin in the camp, and that's how they did it in those days. Failure. Now, Joshua responded to failure correctly. He went to the Lord, and he says, God, what happened? What hap- why did this happen? I am your servant. You are my God. Speak to me. And God did. He spoke to him. We see failure in our lives, too. Is there anybody here who wouldn't say they have experienced failure? I know I have. I have a reminder. In a minute, we're going to see a video clip, so guys, you might get that ready. But this little thing here, this little, I guess they call this a trophy. It's not much of a trophy, is it? It says, 2005. Man, that's a long time ago. 20 years ago almost. Boeing Employees Tennis Club Holiday Classic Men's 4.0 Finalist. Do you know what the word finalist means on a trophy? It means you didn't win. I mean, you're a loser, buddy. This keeps me humble. <laughs> because in, 19, in 2005, I was playing in this tournament uh, at the Boeing Club in Kent. And uh, I was at the height of my youthful prowess. And uh, did well, got to the finals. I was the standard bearer for the club. You got to win one for the club there, Russ. And I go out there playing a 17-year-old high school kid from Federal Way. 17-year-old high school kid. I was 40-some years old. (sighs) National tennis people are there watching. People are in the gallery. Come on, Russ, let's do it. You can do it. I got my tail kicked so bad. I lost. It wasn't even close. It was a 6-2, 6-2, 45-minute, get off the court. I got licked. That kid ran me up one side and down the other, and I felt every day of 40 years old. Failure. I say that story because I failed too. I failed publicly in front of people. I know how it is to think you, you think you can do this thing, and then you realize you didn't have a prayer. This kid was so much better than me, I was out of my league. But we all experience failure. Joshua did. Your pastor did many times. And so did this guy. Let me set the scene. We're going to show a video. I'll give you a little break here. Where were you on January 10th, 2016? Now kind of think back. January 10th, 2016. I can tell you where I was. I was... Uh, it was a Sunday. It was after church. I was sitting at the Nacho restaurant with some of you guys, and we were watching the playoff game of the Seahawks versus the Vikings. Ah, some remember now. This was an incredible game. It went back and forth and back and forth. Never knew what was going to happen. Finally, it came down to the Vikings had the ball. Now, just you might remember this. The Vikings had the ball on the 17-yard line. All they had to do was kick a field goal, game over. The guy kicking hadn't missed a field goal all year. 17-yard line. Chuck could kick it from the 17-yard line. It's an easy kick. And then watch what happened. Let's watch this together. And watch the reactions, by the way. McDermott is the snapper. And the kick is no good. Wow! Go figure. (laughs) Oh, baby, yeah. (laughs) It's time to pray to the heavens, Michael. You're right. No good. Not even close. Let's look at these laces one more time. Jeff Locke, the holder. Is going to try and put it down, and bingo, looking right back at the kicker. And I'm telling you, psychologically, sometimes that can get a kicker. But there's no way 
to practice, making a three-foot putt. You guys remember that? That was a just, I, I still remember my heart up in my chest, and he missed that kick, and it was like, it was like a miracle that he missed that kick, and the Seahawks win all. That was Blair Walsh, by the way. Uh, I don't think he was ever the same after that, missing that kick like that. And, uh, uh, you know, just there's no way to say it other than this. He, he missed it. It was a failure. No excuses. Messed up. Let, let the fans down. You don't get a do-over. There's no second chances. You could see him going, hey, wait, uh, do-over, mulligan. Doesn't, doesn't work that way. I wonder how Joshua felt speaking to the families of the 36 people who were killed at AI. I'm sure he felt like a failure as a leader, as a general, that he'd sent them there. And there's nothing you can do when you fail other than just to say, I blew it. It's my fault. It's on me. My bad. But it doesn't make it any easier to deal with, does it? So I wanted to give you a couple of New Testament examples of people who, in one sense, failed, but how God was able to turn that around. Because I believe that the promises of God are yes and amen for God's people. And I believe he can take even a failure like Blair Walsh and turn it into something beautiful for him. He can take even something as humiliating as me losing to a 17-year-old Federoy kid and turn it to something beautiful for him, if we'll let him. So take your Bibles and turn with me. First story, very briefly, is in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, book of Luke. What can we learn from these stories about failure? How can we overcome failure? New Testament stories. Luke chapter 15, starting with verse 11. Now, most of us know this story, but I'm going to read it again. Luke chapter 15, it's the story of the prodigal son. And uh, as we read this, it's pretty clear who the where the failure lies, okay? But let's go ahead and follow this together. Luke chapter 15, and we're going to go uh, 11 through the, well, the whole story. Luke 15. Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of my goods that fall to me. So he divided them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I am perishing with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to be merry. So we're looking at this story, a familiar story. You've got two sons. The younger one of the two sons decides he doesn't want to live on the farm anymore. Decides, I want to, I want to go to the big city. I want to see life in the fast lane. Don't want to be farmer's boy anymore. And so he says, let's divide up the money, and uh, I'm going to take my inheritance and go make myself rich in the big city. Now, that was 
a, an insult to his father. Because you weren't supposed to divide the inheritance until after he's dead. So to go to him and say, let's divide it now, it's kind of like saying, I wish you were dead, Dad. I just want your money. But he, he does it anyway. He divides up the money and sends the son off with the money. Now, we, I think Moses would have known. If we stopped the story right there, we had known how it turned out, right? A kid with a pocket full of money in the big city, of course, it turned out badly. Spends all of his money. All of his drinking pals are gone. Of course, the inevitable bad time comes. Doesn't have any money. Doesn't have any skills. He's in the city, not on a farm. So he ends up feeding the pigs. And there's a line in there when we talk about dealing with failure that I'd like you to underline. That's in verse 18. Verse 18. When dealing with failure, feeling like just everything is coming apart all around you. And you just feel like, oh, I just can't make it. I can't do this anymore. Verse 18 is the key. It's this. I will arise, go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. See, when times are tough, when we're experiencing failure, the correct response, same thing Joshua did, is to go to your heavenly father. Go to your heavenly father and say, Heavenly Father, I blew it. No excuses, no victim crud, no blaming your neighbor. I blew it. I messed up. I spent the money unwisely. I was dumb. I was young. Father, forgive me. Someone say amen. I will arise and go to my father. Go to him. See, the thing that this story t teaches us is that our Heavenly Father is not a God of judgment. He's not the God that's going to kick you when you're down. When this boy comes back to the farm, I imagine he looked terrible, smelled worse, walking along the road, beaten down as low as you could get. His father saw him and ran and hugged him. He might have been covered in pig slop and cow, and who knows what all, right? But the father hugged him and brought him into his family. Did you see what it says, give him a ring? Did you see that? Give him a ring. The ring was a token of sonship. When you would adopt a slave, you'd give them a ring of your family. So the father's saying, yeah, you took the money, and yeah, you walked away, and yeah, you went to the city, and yes, you embarrassed me, but you're still my son. Even in the failure, give him a ring. He's part of the family. He's still my son. And church, I would say this, if you're sitting there today, and you're saying, you know, I have failed many times in my life. Maybe you failed this very weekend. Maybe you were involved with stuff you're embarrassed to talk about just this weekend. Listen, there's no failure so great that God won't take you back. There's no failure. You can't go to your heavenly father and say, forgive me, I have sinned. And he'll forgive you and restore you to family. I knew a guy who believed that God wanted him to have prosperity financially, which he does, God does, but this guy took it to the point of opening every credit account God he could get and charging them all up to the maximum account. And he had the stereo and the car and the stuff, but he owed thousands of dollars in debt. And guess what happens when you do that? The bills start coming in. And they come in, they got these huge balances and big payments. Anybody been there? And you look at that payment and you say, oh, good Lord, how am I going to pay for that? And then another one, and then another one, and another one. And you're buried. And I remember him at the altar at our previous church saying, saying, Pastor, God promised me to be rich. <laughs> that, that wasn't God's problem there, was it? God may have promised him to be rich, but he didn't tell him to get rich by borrowing money. 
by running up debt. Amen, church? See, the promises of God are yes and amen. But most of the time, when they fail us in some fashion, the problem, oh, this is harsh, the problem comes back to us. Our own sin, our own. Now, sometimes just bad things happen. It's true. But a lot of times, it's our own problem. Bad choices, bad company, bad beliefs. And God says, hey, my promises are still true. This is hard, church. Please don't hate me. But sometimes there's sin in the camp. Sometimes there's sin in the camp. We got to get that sin out. Just like Joshua had to get that sin out so they could win the battle. We got to get that out of our lives so we can win the battle. That young man came back to his father and says, I'm not worthy. And the father says, you're still my son. God's grace and mercy is sufficient. One more story, and then we're going to have the Lord's table together. Second story has to do with a man in Scripture called Judas Iscariot. You guys remember Judas? For those who don't know, Judas was one of the original 12 disciples. And Judas followed Jesus for about three years. And Judas' job was to be the treasurer. He was the bookkeeper. He was the one who kept the coin purse. A lot of people think he might have been pretty highly educated. He could do math. He could do the kinds of things needed to keep the coin going. And he was a follower of Jesus. But to make the story short, remember it was Judas who went to the priests and betrayed his master, Jesus, his rabbi. He told the priests that you could find him on the temple mount. He told them where you could get him and find him. And then they paid him money to betray Jesus. And then he led the soldiers to the very place. Scripture says he walked up to Jesus and gave him a kiss to identify which of the people was Jesus. And then the soldiers arrested him and took him away. Now, if you don't know, this story has an interesting ending. Because it says to us in Matthew chapter 27, starting with verse 3, Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that Jesus was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I've sinned in that I've betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, and he departed, verse 5, and he hanged himself. Judas committed suicide. So full of guilt and remorse, embarrassment, shame. I mean, that's a pretty bad failure, amen? I mean, that's, that's, that's a whopper of a failure. He tried to repent. He went back to the priests, you know, take the money. I don't want the money. Now, if the priests had been any kind of godly men at all, maybe they'd have tried to comfort him and say something to Judas, but instead they basically said, just get out of here. Get out of here. So he goes out and hangs himself. See, the devil lies to us, church. The devil lies. When we have a failure in our lives, the enemy of your soul comes up and you can, it's almost like you can hear his voice in your ears. And he says, you blew it. You're a loser. You can never be redeemed. You're not worthy. You can't serve in God's church. You can't be forgiven. You can't receive the Lord's table. You're a failure. Those are the lies of the devil. Judas listened. Listened to those lies. And killed himself. The devil lies all the time. He lies to these people who are doing mass killings. He lies to people every day who drug overdose, kill themselves with drugs. And listen, he can lie to you and me too. So we realize really when confronted with failure, there are really two ways we can go. 
One way would be like the prodigal son who came running back to his father, confessed his sin, and received God's forgiveness and restoration, knowing that God is well able to forgive every sin. The other way, the wrong way, is to listen to the lies of the enemy. And even if a person doesn't go out and hang themselves, they can sort of spiritually kill themselves. Just basically say, I'm out, I'm done. I'm done with the whole thing. I'm walking away. It doesn't work. It's all a lie. Forget it. Kind of a spiritual death. <coughs> the Lord's table gives us a chance to reset. Gives us a chance to kind of have a fresh start. It's great how Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of him, isn't it? Because we all need to do things in remembrance of him. So today... I just spoke, want to speak to that person who's struggling with failure, struggling with feeling like they're not worthy, struggling like they're out of the game, struggling like they're just too far gone. You know, it's just never... Listen, maybe you're thinking you're too old. Maybe you're thinking you're too young. The truth is that no failure is so big that God's love can't cover it. And you can be restored in fellowship with Him. So we're going to receive the Lord's table together. <clears throat> Josh is here someplace. He's just going to play a little music. Thank you, Josh, for being here today. And what we're going to do is I've got uh, Chuck, who's one of our elders, and John, one of our deacons. They're going to hold these trays. We're going to invite you to go ahead. You can set your Bibles down because you're going to come forward, get your elements, go back to your seat, and then I'll lead us through the communion together. There are some communion elements on the back wall, for those who are maybe are closer to there, a balcony, it's on that tall table by the exit sign there. Maybe somebody can help with that. I see somebody getting up. All right, so guys, why don't you go ahead and grab these trays. And church, why don't you stand? Kind of get a stretch here. Here we go. And they're going to say the body and blood of Christ as you take these and go back to your seat. So go ahead, church. Come on forward. There's no hurry. Just work your way up to the front and then go back to your seat and we'll uh, do this together. There are some in the back there if you want, and it's easier for you. Have a seat when you go back. Just hold on to your elements. Everybody served in the balcony. I can't really see very well. Rhonda, did you get served? Okay. Church, before we receive this together, let me just remind you. Well, you're here, John. Michael Jordan or somebody up there's got it. Just let me remind you about a couple things. Greatest basketball player, most say of all time, is Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan said this. Now just listen regarding failure. He said, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. Michael Jordan said, I've lost almost 300 games. 26 occasions I've been entrusted to take the winning shot and I missed. He said, I failed over and over again and that's why I succeed. See, failure doesn't have to be final. Thomas Edison. I think we have a picture of Thomas. Thomas Edison, of course, great inventor. Famous for inventing the light bulb. But did you know that in school, Thomas Edison was considered too fidgety to be educated. They thought he was stupid in school. Too stupid to learn anything. His mom homeschooled him. He said, I have not failed. I just found 10,000 ways things don't work. 
Stephen King, great novelist. His first book was called Carrie. And in the book Carrie, he submitted it, get this church, 30 different times to different publishers and got turned down every time. Global bestseller, made it to movies. 30 publishers said it wasn't good enough to publish. In fact, he took it and threw it in the garbage, the manuscript. His wife rescued it and talked to him into one more time. The rest, of course, is history. See, church, failure doesn't have to be the end of the road, especially for Christians, because Jesus makes all things new and fresh and a new beginning. Let's take this, we'll peel the top back, you know, have the little cracker there. How are we doing? All right, when you have the cracker in hand, just hold it up like this. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the precious body of our Lord Jesus Christ a body that was beaten, a body that hung on a cross, a body that experienced pain and suffering for each one of us. You told us to do this in remembrance of you, and we remember, God, all you suffered so we can have, indeed, a new beginning. We can understand that no failure is permanent. We can walk in your grace. So, Heavenly Father, we remember that on the night, on the night when you were betrayed, You took the bread and passed it amongst your disciples. You said, take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And let's receive that together. Thank you, God. Now we can just kind of carefully peel back the purple. Careful, it's kind of tricky. Thank you, Jesus. See, the thing is that the Lord's table isn't for perfect people. Some folks have a, this mistaken idea that, you, you know, you're, this is where the perfect people come to get their reward. That's not what this is. This is people who are needy coming to get healed. So if you're sitting there thinking, I'm a failure in my life. I don't even know if I'm worthy, you know, to be doing this. Nobody's worthy. It's the blood of Jesus that makes us worthy. It's a fresh start and a new beginning. You know, I, as I'm looking in this camera and speaking to folks at home, I don't know who might be watching right now. I don't even know where you are with Jesus Christ. Somebody here in this group, upstairs, downstairs, maybe you need to know Jesus. Maybe you've never met him. Maybe you're just here off the street and you're thinking, what is all of this stuff? You know, Listen, Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the only Son of God. He died for your sins on a cross. He rose in three days. And he's alive right now in this place. You can have a fresh start, a new beginning. You don't have to live in your failures anymore. In fact, you could do that right now as we have this juice in front of us. Why don't we pray together, church, and just encourage that person who's sitting there thinking, I don't know what to do, how to pray, I don't, I don't know. Just repeat after me. Why don't we all do it together? You could say something like this. My Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I have failed you many times. I need your forgiveness. I need a fresh start. I believe in you, Jesus. I invite you into my heart. Come and make me new. Let's hold that cup up. Even that person who just prayed. Lord Jesus, we thank you that on the night you were betrayed, you took that cup, took that cup and passed it amongst your disciples. And you said, 
this is the cup of a new covenant. This is the cup of my blood. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive it together. Then you can just take a moment to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for all that you've done. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Isn't he a good God, church? Such a good God. Thank you, God. Well, it's time to send you back out there. Are you ready to serve him out there? Tell other people about Jesus. Be ready. That's what it's about, isn't it? It isn't just what happens in these walls here. It's we take this and we take it to the people who need it. And there's so many who do. Why don't you stand, church? I want to pray for you. Josh, thank you for being here. Uh, Josh will be leading worship on the 21st. Uh, so we'll look forward to that day. Thank you, Lord. Next week is Mother's Day. How many excited? Uh-oh. Come on, guys. Gotta be excited. It's Mother's Day. So, yeah, we'll have a gift for, actually, two gifts for all the mothers and a very special uh, morning snack. I won't tell you what it is, but it's a sweet thing, okay? And that'll be here next week as well. I know you'll have uh, plans with mom probably after church, so we'll honor that time commitment. But please come and make church part of your Mother's Day. You know, set aside the time. Come honor the Lord who gives us mothers and empowers mothers and, uh, There'll be plenty of time in the afternoon. If you haven't made your Mother's Day lunch reservation, better do it today. All right. Are you ready to pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, God, for all of your promises that are yes and amen for all your children. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you have made people new in you this morning. Lord, bless us as we go out. Keep us safe on the roads. Watch over each one of us, we pray. Continue to bless the Semp family. Bless the Smith family at their time as well. And God, we know indeed that you're well able. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. Thank you, everybody. You're dismissed. If you want to take your communion cups and throw them in the garbage on the way out, that would save, uh, save a little work. Thank you, Josh. <coughs> Well then, that's fine.